<laughs> so let's get let's let's do that again. <laughs> um, good afternoon and welcome to the webinar. Uh, this is Brianna Gonzalez with the McSilver Institute, along with the Community Technical Assistance Center and Managed Care Technical Assistance Center. And I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar: The Shame of Being Poor: Stigma as a Social Determinant of Health. The McSilver Institute, CTAC, and MCTAC have partnered to launch this multi-platform online series intended to help clinical professionals, community health workers, educators, policymakers, and any and all who influence our healthcare system to think critically about those social factors that have a direct and indirect impact on individuals' health and mental health. Throughout this series, we will bring into focus the linkage between poverty, racial disparities, and health inequities and discuss ways in which these issues can be addressed to improve health outcomes for all. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to orient everyone to the WebEx system so you know how to participate in today's event. Please note that upon joining the webinar, you have been placed on mute to avoid any background noises, noises that may distract others from listening to the presentation today. If you come across any technical issues during today's event, please chat to the host who will be able to assist you. You will have the opportunity to submit questions for the Q&A portion of today's presentation by utilizing the chat box feature, which is located on the right-hand side of your screen. If it is not visible, click the dialog bubble at the top right toolbar and it should appear. In order to ensure that we are able to answer as many questions as time permits, we are requesting that you send in your questions at any point during the webinar, and we will address them during the Q&A portion of today's webinar. We are very pleased to have Elizabeth Bowen and Keith Chan with us today to discuss the ways in which stigma can be a social determinant of health and impact people's service-seeking experiences. Elizabeth Bowen is an assistant professor in the, social work, in the School of Social Work at the University of Buffalo, State University of New York. Prior to getting her PhD, she worked for several years as a social worker managing supportive housing programs for homeless HIV-positive individuals in Chicago. Her research focuses on homelessness and housing as a social determinant of health. She recently completed a community-based qualitative study on homelessness among young adults in Buffalo. Keith Chan is an assistant professor in the School of Social Work at University at Albany State University of New York. His research is on health disparities for Asian elderly and other vulnerable populations. He has almost 15 years of direct practice experience with minority and immigrant populations, persons diagnosed with serious mental health illness, veterans, the elderly, and homeless populations. He is currently working with Food Not Bombs, a grassroots community activist organization which supports social justice action and offers free vegan meals and free produce every week to the community. Elizabeth and Keith have a wealth of knowledge and experience, and we look forward to today's presentation. Again, everyone, I apologize for that delay at the beginning, but now I'd like to turn it over to Keith and Elizabeth to get us started. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope that you can see and hear me. I'm Elizabeth, and I'm really happy to have the chance to be with you today and talk about stigma as a social determinant of health. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to give you uh, the agenda so you know what our plan is for today. Uh, first thing we're going to go over is just what is stigma. I'm sure this is a term many of us have heard before. Um, we might be familiar with this, but we may not all be on the same page of what we mean by stigma. So we'll start just by defining that. Then we're going to move into um, how is stigma a social determinant of health? So if you're participating in this webinar, I know this is part of a whole series on the social determinants of health. You may have heard that term before. You may have heard of stigma before. You may or may not have uh, put those two things together. So that's part of what we're going to talk about is how is stigma um, sometimes the determinant of health and how does it affect people seeking different services? And we'll use two different case studies to talk about that, one about food insecurity and one about homeless young adults. I should say there is somewhat of a theme of food insecurity and homelessness in this presentation just because 
that's an area where both Keith and I uh, have some of our practice experience and have done some of our research. So we will give several examples uh, from these two issues of homelessness and food insecurity, but that's certainly not the only issues that we're going to talk about and certainly not the only areas where I think this is relevant. And then we want to end the presentation by getting into what do we do about stigma? So it's one thing if we recognize it, we know what we mean by stigma, we understand that it's a social determinant of health, um, but then what can we actually do in our practice to try to minimize stigma and break down some of the barriers to people seeking services? So two things we'll talk about there are trauma-informed care practices and then moving more into activism and advocacy to actually address uh, some of the issues that are the root causes of stigma. And then we'll conclude and we will end uh, with the Q&A part of the webinar. So first thing that we wanted to go over here is what do we mean by stigma? Again, this is a pretty common term probably for a lot of us, but we may not all be on the same page about the definition. So here I'm just going to give you kind of a textbook technical definition of stigma, again, just to help us be on the same page about this. So stigma refers to stereotypes or negative views attributed to a person or groups of people when their characteristics or behaviors are viewed as different from or inferior to societal norms. So to me, the important things to take away from this definition is when we talk about stigma, we're often talking about stereotyping, generalizations that we may make about a group of people, and we're not talking about positive or even neutral types of generalizations here. Really with stigma, what we mean is when we make some kind of negative or undesirable inference about a person uh, based on either some characteristic they share, uh, maybe their living situation, maybe a condition they have, maybe where they live or something they're going through. But when based on any of those factors, we infer something negative about them, that's essentially what we're getting at with stigma. Um, so we wanted to ask you now if you can use uh, the chat tool. Um, when you hear stigma, what do you think of? What can stigma be related to? So there's, I think, all kinds of different characteristics and conditions that can potentially be stigmatized. When you hear stigma, what do you think of that being related to? And if you can just type uh, the first thing that comes to mind into the chat box. I'll give people a, a few uh, seconds at least to think about that. So I see a few things uh, coming in here, mental health, age, negative view statistics, that's important, ability, racism, another comment on mental health, mental health, the sense of being ostracized, ability and disability, I think, you know, that's all part of stigma often, health conditions, mental health discrimination. HIV, that's, you know, certainly a condition that has a long history of stigma, suicide, still very stigmatized. Sexuality, sexual history, non-traditional lifestyles, right? I think anything that we might perceive as deviating from, quote, the mainstream where society's norms uh, can potentially be stigmatized. SMI, so serious mental illness, clients, housing, domestic violence, uh, socioeconomic status, PTSD. So I'm sensing kind of a mental health theme, though I think this is a good brainstorming in terms of um, hitting upon many different characteristics related both to aspects of people's identity as well as to different conditions, um, different aspects of a person's life that can be stigmatized. Um, well, I'm going to uh, pass this uh, now to Keith, uh, who's going to ask you another question about stigma. So hi everyone, um, my name is Keith Chan, um, and uh, very delighted and, and honored to be here to talk to everyone and share some of my thoughts. Um, so a, after doing that exercise, um, something that I wanted to use to help generate discussion um, is a poll um, that we, we uh, ended up using. Um, and uh, we're, we would like some feedback from uh, all uh, participants around this. Um, please choose which of the following uh, would you, uh, do you think would be the most stigmatizing? Uh, mental health hospitalization, being homeless, being disabled, and being hungry. Now, bearing in mind, this is not an exhaustive list, but um, because of the fact that we're um, doing a presentation on homelessness and also uh, uh, um, some of the issues that we're talking about today, um, these are the ones that 
just came to mind um, as what we would um, include. So please answer this um, right now if you can. What's interesting about um, these particular issues about um, uh, when it comes to stigma is that um, these are many of the issues that um, the populations that we work with. Um, I'm a social worker myself, um, but um, many of us who are helping professionals, um, these are essentially the issues that many of our populations would be working with, uh, would be dealing with. What's interesting also about these particular issues is that, um, and I can always already see some of the objections that you might have is that, you know, these are probably some of the issues that many people have to deal with all at the same time. Um, because um, a person who's dealing with homelessness, um, it's very likely that they also might be de being, um, deal with food insecurity and being hungry. Um, oftentimes if we're working with uh, a population with serious mental illness, um, these are some of the same issues that um, they also might be facing as well. All right, so I'm looking at some of the initial results, um, and it looks like we have uh, so far, um, yeah, um, a lot of folks with no answer. <laughs> uh, met, mental health, uh, being homeless, 35% uh, endorsed the answer of being homeless, being the most stigmatizing. 23% um, so far endorsed the response of mental health hospitalization um, as being the most stigmatizing. 2% uh, endorsed the answer um, being disabled. Uh, and then also 2% endorsed the answer being hungry. So um, part of what is interesting about um, the work that we do as social workers or helping professionals, clinicians, people who work with vulnerable populations, is that uh, we're taught in school, and this is as, a, as an instructor, I teach my students that um, we have to clearly examine um, these subjective experiences, um, and we're taught actually not to rank them for ourselves. But um, in my experience working as a social worker, when um, I was dealing with um, a population of folks who had serious mental illness, um, we had limited housing spots. So we had to decide who actually gets to move in um, to this public housing uh, um, facility and who doesn't. So in many regards, we're forced to make those decisions um, every day as professionals. Um, and also the framework of how we examine poverty, um, it's really based on a means-tested system where um, unfortunately we, uh, it's based on this understanding of who are the deserving poor. Um, so I raised this as a question um, also for us to start thinking about um, what exactly is stigma and how do we actually even evaluate it. So I'm sure maybe, maybe many, many of you uh, have thoughts about this, so feel free to chat in <laughs> at this point, so, and, and we'll be looking at the chat list. Um, so I wanted to also go over um, why stigma is a social determinant of health. Um, first, um, a lot of the literature that looks at social determinants of health um, draws its theory base from, uh, at least in some of the work that I've done, um, from the theory of fundamental causes. Uh, what this theory says is that there are enduring association uh, of mortality and socioeconomic status. And a lot of it comes from an, an array of resources such as money, knowledge, prestige, power, and beneficial social conditions. What's interesting is that some of the research that uh, has been done on this uh, has found that the stigma of homelessness is, uh, the, this label is equal to a mental health uh, hospitalization. Part of it is because folks are being blamed for the hardships of, the, of their conditions. Um, food insecurity is also a very in, uh, uh, interesting issue. It disproportionately impacts the most vulnerable populations, unsurprisingly, such as children and youth, seniors, immigrants, and other health disparities populations. Also, the stigma of food insecurity can prevent persons from seeking out resources, meaning that despite the fact that there are resources available, 
oftentimes they don't seek them out. And that's really the problem sometimes is that um, our inability to connect the dots for some of these folks who are the most vulnerable. So uh, we have a case study that uh, I would like for um, um, participants to respond to, that we would like for participants to respond to. Um, so let me read this to everyone. Um, a young African-American male who attends college um, fails out because he cannot connect to his professors and peers. He loses his campus housing and meal plan. His family does not know that he is no longer in school, um, but they would have limited resources to help him. He works part-time jobs at gas stations, warehouses, and washes dishes at restaurants. And unfortunately, he does not earn enough and begins to go hungry. What would you recommend as a professional working with this young man? So maybe we can take a few moments right now um, for, uh, uh, for us to start chatting in some of our answers. So maybe what I'll also share is that um, this case study example um, actually comes from uh, a real life example um, of someone actually I encountered in some of the work that I've done. Uh, I'm seeing some of the responses right now. Uh, encourage him to attend support groups. Uh, I might suggest Job Corps. He should, he should reach out to his family, right? Um, seeking out social resources. Um, tell him to look into SNAP benefits, um, otherwise known as food stamps. Uh, reconnecting with family and other supports. Uh, applying for TANF, locate uh, food banks. Um, there's also a question, is he resigning in a shelter or now resigning at home? So based on this example, um, my thought is that um, this person is actually not resigning at home right now. Um, oftentimes when we're talking about young folks, um, they are homeless, but um, they might be temporarily staying with uh, family or friends or oftentimes sleeping on the couch somewhere. Um, let's see, I want to investigate the factors in, in his inability to connect with his professors and peers. Um, so that's also from uh, a much more of a root cause perspective, right? Um, this is part of the reason why he was not able to, to su successfully nav navigate um, his uh, educational experiences. Um, I think that support groups and reaching out to his family would be good. Uh, I wonder if he wanted to seek, uh, continue seeking higher education or if he wanted to find full-time employment too. Um, SNAP, local food banks, soup kitchens. First, to understand why he didn't connect with professors. Is there an opportunity to return? Um, reminding him of his resilience. Focus on hierarchy of needs. May need to focus on resources before mental health can be main focused. Um, go back to school and talk to the advisor. Connecting him with food banks to meet with his immediate needs and reach out to resources at college. So um, we've gotten a lot of responses about um, helping him connect to uh, many of his resources. Um, I'll share this, that um, this is actually a, a case example from my own experience um, when I was working in this organization, Food Not Bombs. Um, what happened was that I encountered this young man who was a student um, at SUNY Albany, um, at University of Albany, and um, unfortunately he was, uh, he ended up essentially asked to, to stop his education because his grades are failing. Uh, at the time when I saw him, we were putting out food and, and we were just giving out to the community. Um, and he had his Yolmini sweatshirt over his head. And I walked over and started talking to him. Um, and um, I told him I was a professor at the school, at the School of Social Welfare. Uh, and then that's when he disclosed to me that he um, had ended up uh, dropping out of school. Um, and that he had his um, um, sweatshirt over his head because he didn't want any of his friends seeing um, him there actually getting food from us. Um, so I thought that was a really, um, yeah, I, 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 I was personally touched by that uh, when I um, talked to this young man. Uh, I also shared with him that at one point when I was in college, um, I was also homeless and, and I was also uh, food insecure as well. Um, I gave him his card, um, I gave him my card, asked him to reach out to me if he wanted to. Um, so far, I haven't heard from him, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, all right, 
So, oh, oh I, I see a former student of mine actually <laughs> on the chat as well. All right, that's great. Um, okay, but we should move on. Um, let's see. So I'm going to pass the ball back to um, Betsy over here, Dr. Bowen. All right. Looks like I, okay, <laughs> back to me. Um, so I'm going to share a second case study, which I think has some overlap um, in themes with the one that Dr. Tan just shared. Um, so these are a couple of quotes from the research project that I recently finished with young people experiencing homelessness in Buffalo. So this study was all about uh, people age 18 to 24 who were in a homeless situation in Buffalo. Um, so the first quote, this is from a 22-year-old multiracial male. And he said, I don't like being 22 years of age, homeless, out on the street. I don't like people looking down on me or on some of my friends because no one really knows how a situation is until you're in it. So that's the first quote. A uh, second quote, this is from a 22-year-old African-American female. They, and she's referring to our local uh, Department of Social Services, they think that because I'm young, I'm young-minded, that I don't know what I want. They don't treat me like an adult. And our third quote, this is from a 20-year-old African-American male. A lot of people that know me, and it would be making me seem like, hello, you're not supposed to be here. And he's referring to a local soup kitchen program that gives people free meals. It's more embarrassing than not, especially to be seen walking out of there. So one thing that I was struck by doing these interviews, again, these are all with young people who were experiencing homelessness. And we heard many people say things like, you know, I'm 18 or I'm 19 or 20 or 22 or whatever age. And this is not where my life is supposed to be. I know at this age, I should be in college or I should be working on a career. I should be getting my own place, kind of getting my life started. That's what I see, you know, my peers around me doing. But here I am in these you know, homeless situations, struggling with very basic things, such as finding my next meal or finding a place to sleep. And most of these young people had been through some very difficult situations in their lives, very difficult situations with their families. You know, it certainly, you know, was not their fault that they were finding themselves homeless at this age, but they still, I think, had a lot of shame and some shame internalized related to the fact uh, that they were homeless. And so, I saw in response to the case study um, in the last slide that many people had some great suggestions there in the chat box about connecting this young man uh, to SNAP benefits, to food pantries, or to other local programs. What I often heard from the participants in our research study was sometimes they knew about these programs. They knew they could apply for food stamps. They knew that there were soup kitchens they could go to for free meals. They knew there were shelters and transitional housing programs. But they had so much shame around using these programs that even when they knew it was available and that they needed help, they didn't want to go because it felt so embarrassing. It felt like such a shameful thing to have to admit that you're homeless or that you're hungry and that you need help. And I think that's exactly what stigma is. And when people have internalized that stigma, it can create that shame and prevent people from seeking the services they need. So I wanted to ask another question, and if you could respond in the chat box. Um, so I think sometimes the people that seek our help or our services, they may not always admit to feeling embarrassed or to feeling that shame. But if, let's say, one of these young people um, that are reflected in these quotes here, wherever you work, if one of these young people came in and they were to open up to you and to say one of these things to you about how they, you know, don't like being in this situation and that they're embarrassed to be seen, um, what would you say to reassure? someone like that, if they were to open up to you about how they felt embarrassed about seeking services, what would you say to reassure them? And I'll give people a few moments here to think about how to respond. Yeah, there's some good responses. Anyone would feel that way but you haven't done anything wrong, right? To remind people this isn't their fault. Sometimes we can empathize with our clients and say, really, you know, I've been there myself. And I think Dr. Chan's story spoke to that. Mm -hmm. You know, reminding people we all need help sometimes. It could be any of us. Yeah, I think I like the strength-based response here that uh, someone has suggested. 
saying, I think it shows an incredible amount of strength to reach out for help when you need it. And that's something, you know, we need to remember as service providers just to walk through our doors. We may not think anything of it, but sometimes that alone takes a lot of courage just because of the level of stigma um, around seeking help and around some of the issues that we work with. Yeah, a lot of these responses that I'm seeing, I think, really speak to empathy and the need to empathize with people and remind our participants that they're not alone in their struggles mm -hmm. and that they're not alone in needing help. Normalizing their embarrassment. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk, um, we will be getting to some ideas for what we can do uh, to help minimize the sense of stigma and shame as well. And that is coming up on the next slide. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and move to that now. Thank you for your responses there. I think there's a lot of great ideas and very thoughtful ideas there. So as we mentioned, we wanted to end the presentation uh, with some ideas for what do we actually do about this. So we recognize stigma is an issue that many of our participants or service recipients may be dealing with. Um, what can we do to actually minimize that or prevent that or help address that? So the first idea, and I'm going to talk about this before we pass it back to Dr. Chan, um, is around trauma-informed care. So some of you may be familiar with this term of trauma-informed care. I think this is an idea that's kind of sweeping across many different service systems. And this is related to all the research that we have now on trauma that shows, for one thing, just how common trauma is. Many people have been through something traumatic. And trauma is a pretty broad term. It generally refers to a situation where something happens to someone that produces some intense fear and distress and often has long-term either psychological or physiological or both uh, consequences. And so we know that many people we work with in any setting, whether it's mental health, primary health care, social services, homeless services, addictions, behavioral health, whatever it may be, we know a lot of our clients have been through trauma, sometimes multiple trauma. It could be different types of abuse or neglect. It could be assault. It could be the trauma of being incarcerated. Um, there's, you know, really countless examples. And so the trauma-informed care model helps us shift from this mentality of what is wrong with you to what have you been through. And we also know in many settings, the people we work with are not necessarily easy to work with. So we might see from our clients behaviors that look like acting up. We might see people that are really rude to us or are resistant to our help. Um, people that are not cooperative, people that act, you know, um, in an aggressive way, or people that maybe just make it difficult to work with because they don't want to tell us anything about themselves or they don't want to reveal any information. And so a trauma-informed care mindset, instead of just being frustrated and thinking, you know, what's wrong with this person? Why are they acting in this way? It helps us shift to what has this person been through and maybe how have their experiences and their traumas affected how they might behave or how they might act or feel when they walk through our doors. And then how can we respond to them in a way um, that respects the fact that they may have been through trauma and make sure that we try not to re-traumatize them through the services that we provide when we're trying to help. And I think this is important, not just mental health care, um, but I heard from the participants that I interviewed in my study of homeless young adults, they often talked about the difficulty they had, not just seeking, some of them did want mental health counseling, but they would talk about when they were just trying to apply for social services or apply for benefits. You know, often they felt they were not treated with respect. Um, and I think using some of these basic principles of trauma-informed care could help to overcome uh, the barriers in that sense of disrespect that people sometimes feel. So the principles of trauma-informed care, there is a lot of different um, information and literature out there on this, but these are the six basic principles, uh, which are safety, trustworthiness and transparency, collaboration and peer support, choice, empowerment, and intersectionality. And that last one, intersectionality, that refers to the fact that all of our identities are made up of many different parts, so including our racial and ethnic identity, our gender identity, our sexual identity, um, our immigrant status, the language we use, our religious identity, I mean, countless different facets to our identities. And intersectionality means that in our services, we should really not just be tolerant, but respect and affirm all of those different aspects of a person's identity. So whatever setting you work in, you can probably maybe think of some of the ways that maybe your agency employs some of these principles. 
So what kind of practices do we have at our agencies? What things do we do to help our clients or our participants feel safe? For trustworthiness and transparency, this has to do with, um, you know, how clear are the guidelines for seeking services? So whatever type of benefit or service we provide, what are the eligibility cr criteria for that? When participants come into our program, what exactly are they signing up for? What are they expected to comply with? How transparent are we about that? We may assume that this is clear, but unless we walk people through that and have a conversation around it, it really might not be that clear to people. And when we can be transparent about our procedures, about our what kinds of support we can provide, about the conditions of that support, that can really help uh, to build trust with people. Uh, similarly, collaboration and peer support. I know some programs, different settings, may be more expert driven, where we have to you know, say I'm your healthcare provider or your service provider and I have the knowledge and I'm gonna give that to you. And there may be a time and a place where we need that. But I think a lot of programs we can also use peer support. So how can we help people who are going through the same things support each other? How can clients be active collaborators and be actual contributors and partners and not just service recipients? Uh, choice, what choices do we give clients in the programs we offer? Um, are there ways maybe we can maximize those choices. And these principles, as you can probably see, are interrelated. So empowerment, when we give people choices and they have the chance to make meaningful choices, that can be empowered. When people have the chance to be a service partner, when they have the chance to um, not just receive services, but help their peers and participate in peer support, all of that can be empowering. And then lastly, intersectionality, again, making sure we do all of these things in a way that feels affirming to people's identities. So these principles, um, I think they, they sound good. They're not always easy to implement um, in practice, and I don't know of any program that does this perfectly and implements these all the time. But if you can maybe think about where you work, think about the ways that your program or your agency does implement these principles. And then maybe just one thing you may be able to take away from this is start to think about what are some of the ways you could do to implement them even more or to do a, a better or a more, more robust job of maximizing choice, promoting peer support, making things transparent, promoting safety, empowerment, and intersectionality. And I think that could go a long way toward helping people feel comfortable um, given all the internalized stigma and shame that people may have uh, when they come in to seek our services. And with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Keith, who's gonna talk through uh, some other ideas for reducing stigma uh, more from an action and an advocacy mindset. And I'm having a little trouble passing it back to him. Uh, Brianna, maybe if you could help me pass uh, the speaker back to Keith. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Betsy. So, um, so some action steps that we um, and um, I, I say this too because I feel that um, um, coming coming to to you guys as a social worker, um, I feel that our charge and our mission is really working with the most vulnerable um, and the least advantaged populations. Um, and I think there's a lot of folks right now who are very disenchanted and disaffected. Um, and a lot of it has to do with our political climate and what's been going on in the last week. Um, but I believe the solution is really community. Um, part of what we can do is directly engage with the community especially these vulnerable populations, because uh, no matter what you believe in terms of uh, uh, who our leadership should be uh, for our country, um, I think there's a real need right now for those people who are the most marginalized. And those are the folks um, who really need our help the most. And to also look at how we can ta tackle specific issues, um, not who voted for who, but what can we actually concretely do to improve conditions for people who are the most vulnerable? I think part of that has to do with also re-examining the medical model approach. Um, we have to ch challenge our paradigms um, of how we think, um, uh, what we think about power and privilege. Um, part of the task that we have to engage in is to break down barriers of poverty. Um, as professionals working with these vulnerable populations, we, we do have to acknowledge that we have a very professional stance 
um, and that we hold more privilege and more power. But at the same time, there are ways that we can actually engage um, our populations as uh, collaborators, as what Betsy was pointing out to, um, not just in terms of the decisions that they make for themselves, but also in, in engaging in activism to directly address these social problems. Um, whether it's making sure that um, the roads are more safe uh, for people with disability um, by, make, by showing up and just speaking to it and um, supporting causes so that uh, they can paint some yellow lines right on the sidewalks that people, it's safer for people to walk, um, or looking at how we can more actively address food insecurity or other issues of poverty, um, and then also being partners with them. Um, with these folks um, in, in advocating for themselves and for others. Um, so um, what I would like to show everyone right now um, would be a video um, from um, uh, Food Not Bombs, an organization that um, I'm involved with. Uh, what we do is we take um, donations from supermarkets, from uh, community gardens. Uh, everything's volunteer driven. Um, we have folks who come and get food with us. Um, I actually eat at the meals every Monday, um, and it's awesome food. Um, we make vegan meals, um, and we also pass out food, uh, 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 free produce, um, oftentimes to uh, urban areas where there are food deserts. Um, and it's really interesting because many of the folks who come in to, to get food from us, we don't ask for identification. Um, we try to get folks to actually help out, be part of the community. We try to watch out for each other. We have folks who are African Americans, we're, who are in wheelchairs, who are older. We have folks who are Mexican immigrants, refugees from Vietnam. Um, we have trans uh, teens who come in because um, this is a place where they feel comfortable coming in and eating. Um, if, they're, uh, um, if they don't have family supports, if they've been turned out for, by their family members. Um, so let's see, let's um, see if I can actually show the video right now. Um, I believe Caitlin is the person doing it, okay. All right, so uh, I'm not sure, I, I was looking at my screen, it looks like um, the uh, um, video only showed one image. Um, did other people see, see uh, more than one image? There, there should have been more, more pictures. Oh, okay, all right, so it seems like everybody saw many different images. Okay, so this is my computer. Um, okay, so um, that's Food Not Bombs. So as you can see, um, we have folks from, who, who have very diverse backgrounds. Um, people come to us from uh, many different places, but um, we try to really have a sense of community. And um, actually last week uh, we had um, um, the uh, older African-American uh, uh, woman who was in a wheelchair. Um, she asked, invited all of us to come and help support um, a, a community meeting so that they can make roads safer because um, when she was getting off the bus, um, I don't know, last October, she had fallen from a wheelchair and then as a consequence, um, she had to have her toe amputated. Um, so um, she wasn't looking for compensation. She just wants to make things safer for everyone. So um, I think that's the kind of thing that we need to do. Um, 
so that we can actually empower people and, and also have them be active partners in, in some of these things that, that can improve uh, condition, conditions for everyone. Um, I believe that's part of the solution in addressing stigma for the populations that we work with. So with that, um, let's see. Um, here are our set of resources. Uh, I'm going to pass the ball then, I guess, back to Brianna, who's going to be doing the Q&A sessions for us, uh, or we're going to start um, with the Q&A sessions um, in case there are any questions. Yes, thank you so much, Keith and Betsy, for that presentation. Um, we have received a couple questions that come that have come through. Um, please feel free, everybody, to submit additional questions in the chat box. Um, I'll be collecting them and posing them to our presenters today. Um, so the first question I have is, from an overall societal perspective, do you think there is a continuum of stigma? Some conditions are more stigmatizing than others, and over time, some conditions may become more or less stigmatizing. For example, AIDS has had a greater stigma in the 1980s than it does now. Also, what about a condition being stigmatized in one culture but not stigmatized in another culture? For example, certain dress codes are acceptable in one place but not in another. Well, I can chime in here, um, or Keith can. Ever, can everyone hear me? Um, yes, we can. I think that's, okay, I think that's an excellent question. Um, and I, there really is no simple answer to that. Um, I, the example of AIDS is a really good example. I think sometimes some conditions do become less stigmatized over time, but that doesn't just happen on its own. So I think that happens for one thing through when we have advances in treatment, I do think that helps. I think the advances we've had in mental health treatment have done something to help destigmatize mental health conditions, though they still are quite stigmatized. Um, I think that, you know, the advances we had with HIV and AIDS, the treatment there, again, somewhat helped to destigmatize that condition. But even advances in treatment alone are not enough. So I think some of those changes we see in how some conditions or some characteristics come to be destigmatized, that really you know happens through direct advocacy, through different groups, um, often of people, often led by people with these conditions who have helped um, do public awareness campaigns, sometimes through art, through creative endeavors, through scholarship and research. I mean, I think stigma is definitely not static, and it does change over time. So. And to get to the part of the question about, you know, could we have a continuum of stigma of most to least stigmatized? I don't know if anyone's done research on that, but I think it'd be hard to have consensus on it um, because, again, it is somewhat subjective. And I think the person who asked that question has a great point, too, about um, this is also not static between cultures. So for um, different, among people of different ages, among people from different cultural backgrounds, even geographically, something that's, you know, acceptable and maybe common or even celebrated, say, in New York City, you know, may not be viewed the same in a small town in, say, rural New York. Um, so we can see a lot of variability across groups and across place. To me, the most important thing to keep in mind is that stigma is sort of in the eye of the beholder. So something that we might think our client shouldn't worry about, we might say, oh, it's, you know, not a big deal anymore. A lot of people struggle with mental health, you know, you shouldn't worry about that. But if our, our client feels stigmatized for any aspect, you know, that means that's real to them. And I think we need to understand that and hopefully be able to talk to them about that and hopefully, you know, work through some of that. But if someone feels stigmatized, then, you know, that's, I think, the, the main thing that matters. Keith, I don't, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I do. Um, it's funny because I'm I'm working on a, a study right now that I'm about to to submit um, as an academic paper, uh, looking at um, the racial and ethnic differences in use of assistive devices for uh, um, older Americans who have a disability. Mm -hmm. So this is some population data. Um, what I looked at was. Um, Basically, these are folks who have a disability. They recognize they have a disability. But what I'm finding is for Asian elders, for example, um, 
Asian elders are 50% less likely to use an assistive device like a cane or a walker or a wheelchair compared to other ethnic groups. So, and I control for education, I control for, for health, I control for all, all kinds of other things, uh, insurance, insurance didn't matter, um, income didn't really matter. Um, it's, um, so I, I don't know for sure um, because the, I, I didn't have data to really answer this question, but I believe it really has to do with stigma. Um, and so I started looking for answers and I think legislative action um, is very important. Um, the passage of the ADA, uh, I think that changed cultural perceptions in the United States um, um, in terms of how we regard disability in ways that um, hasn't really been done in Europe or Asia. Um, so I think there are uh, certain cultural attitudes that come into play. Um, so I believe legislative action is important, um, and that's much more on the macro level. But then also on the micro level, we have to address uh, how we look at stigma uh, individually. So for Asian populations, for example, the word um, um, being disabled, right, in Chinese literally translates to damaged and worthless. So it's highly stigmatizing. And so I think we have to really examine what we're thinking about. Um, and of course, as a person, you know, who uh, is an immigrant myself, and I, uh, I identify very strongly as an Asian American, and I speak Cantonese, and, and I can talk to some of these folks, um, I can't go in there and say, like, well, you're wrong. You're wrong. Your stigma is wrong. You shouldn't be thinking this way. I, I, I can't do that, right? Um, so part of it is also listening and then helping to understand on a micro level uh, what, what the subjective experience of the person is, but then also to help them engage in their communities. Um, and then there's also the macro level, right? We have, to, we have to take legislative action. We have to do advocacy. So we have to do all these things. Um, so unfortunately, it's not an easy answer. <laughs> yes, that's certainly true. But thank you for that very dynamic response. Um, so a couple more questions that have come through. Um, can you speak to ways uh, to help others and ourselves cope with stigmatizing in the face of scapegoating that is happening in the current political mm -hmm. climate in which bullying and aggression are openly endorsed as socially acceptable? Yeah, yeah. what a, a difficult and timely question. Um, and I like the person who asked that framed it with, you know, how can we support ourselves and others? Because that's, you know, part of intersectionality too, that we recognize often we're not, you know, separate from the events and the things that affect our participants and the things our participants may struggle with. Um, I think you know, my gut reaction here is that activism is a very healthy and necessary response. And there is a lot of scapegoating going on right now. We have certainly heard terrible things in the media and terrible things said by people in immense positions of power um, about certain groups, about immigrants, about people with disabilities, about women. I think activism is kind of what I go to. So, you know, we all, we have to acknowledge that this is some of the narrative out there, but we also can fight to define our own narrative. And I think we can get involved in social action. We can get involved in protests. We can get involved um, in different ways of saying, you know, this is really not okay to speak about me or about my friends or about the people I work with in this language. But that, I mean, it's it's difficult and we need to be sure to take good care of ourselves while we do that. Self-care is a huge part of trauma-informed care too. Uh, Keith, you may have things to add to that. Yeah, I, I think there is definitely a lot of um, concern right now, especially with, um, a lot of communities of color um, about what's going on. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, a, a lot of the stuff I'm seeing on social media and the news, um, it, it's very concerning for me. It's very concerning for me. Um, but I think um, part of the solution is bystander intervention, right? Um, I'm not saying go in there in a dangerous situation and, and try to make things horrible uh, or, or to try to you know, but part of what I find, so in my other life, I, I also teach karate. Um, and uh, I, um, the first thing I tell my students in, in my karate class is that your first line of self-defense are your eyes, right? So part of what um, we can do is we can make sure that people know that we're looking. I'm looking. 
I'm, I'm seeing what's going on. Um, making sure that people understand that people aren't suffering alone and that we're, what we're doing right now is that we're, we're presenting ourselves to the world and uh, we're holding each other accountable. So sometimes that in and of itself is enough to de-escalate the situation. Um, but then also knowing, letting people know that you're, that they're not alone, that they have allies. So I think there are different ways that we can address this issue. So um, that's what I would offer. Great, thank you for those responses. Um, so another question that has come in. In practice, what have you found to be the most powerful to create a breakthrough with those that you encounter that appear emotionally or socially paralyzed by stigma? like getting them to the point that they reach out for help as opposed to suffering in silence. Have you found generational difference in this? Hmm. Keith, do you want to take the first shot? Yeah. Um, I think part of it is starting to listen and uh, understand. And uh, so I think in order to have very intense conversations, um, um, we're, we're challenging uh, um, paradigms of thinking. Um, part of the solution requires a certain level of vulnerability and intimacy. Um, I think um, as a profession uh, in social work and other professions, um, and certainly I was trained this way uh, when I was practicing years ago, um, was that we weren't, we're not supposed to disclose to others um, about our own experiences. Um, I think the spirit behind that is important because um, we don't want to turn whatever we say to uh, the people we work with, with uh, into therapy for ourselves, right? We certainly don't want that. Um, but um, I think there is a certain use of self, especially when we can advance the conversation and uh, help people understand that they're not suffering in silence. Um, I think it's important for us to consider how we can share some of these things so that we can be vulnerable, um, but at the same time empowering. Um, so I think we, many of us, I, I think myself included, um, I have to really re-examine what, uh, what I'm willing to share and how we can actually bridge this gap. So because without intimacy, it's very difficult to resolve this intense emotion. So, um, so that's what I would offer. I guess I would add to that, I think the other component um, of what self-disclosure and things we might disclose to clients that can sometimes, I think, be powerful for breaking down um, the sense of stigma or shame a person might be feeling. The other part is, I think, going back to the peer support. So it's one thing for me as someone's social worker or service provider to say, you know, look, you know, this is not your fault or this is really a very normal thing a lot of people deal with or you shouldn't, you know, believe these negative things you hear. I can and, you know, would say those things to a person, but a lot of that will come more powerfully if from a peer, I think, for people of any age. So for young people, hearing it from another young person, for older people, hearing it from another older person, you know, whatever group someone may be part of. So that's difficult because I think stigma isolates people is the other part of it too. It makes people not want to connect with their peers sometimes. But I think if in our programming we can try to even just have informal spaces where people that are coming in can talk to each other and can start to build relationships. Maybe this happens through group work sometimes. Um, but I think, you know, when I hear clients or people I talk to tell me about a moment where they felt things really kind of connected for them in a powerful way, it's often it's often not something they heard from a professional. It's often something they heard from a peer or someone else going through a similar situation. So if we can try our best to facilitate those connections, I think that can help. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, pose two more questions. Um, the first one is, um, do the elderly Chinese also view other cultures having people with disability as stigmatizing or just themselves? Hmm. That's a very interesting question. Um, it's, um, unfortunately, there are certain cultural beliefs um, that relate to disability and also to mental illness. Um, and this is, unfortunately, something that, that um, I've encountered a lot in my practice work um, with um, other Chinese folks is that um, there's a belief in reincarnation, right? So um, 
if um, you're born with certain disabilities or if uh, you're born with certain uh, um, issues about mental illness, then um, there's an attribution um, that uh, uh, sometimes people might make that you are a horrible person in your previous life and that what you're dealing with right now is essentially just retribution for something horrible that you did because you're a horrible person. Um, I think that's highly problematic. Um, I think that's something that unfortunately makes it so that people are less willing to um, seek out resources or to really um, be able to, to talk about some of the issues that they're dealing with. Um, it's a difficult issue. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly what it's going to take. I, I meant it might take me my next 10 years of my career to try to like really start chipping away at this problem. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what, what the solution is. So um, I, I welcome any suggestions from, from uh, you guys about how we might be able to tackle that. Thank you. Um, so our last question um, is specifically about food, not bombs. Um, so is it accessible by public transportation? Um, in more rural areas, transportation is a barrier, and Medicaid transportation only takes you to medical appointments. So some recommendations about transportation. Right. So um, food not bombs is completely volunteer driven. So um, we um, try to do it at a location, usually it's um, more, there's much more of a presence um, in, with food not bombs in um, more urban areas, metropolitan uh, centers. Um, so in New York City, for example, there are quite a few. In fact, there's one in Brooklyn, two in Manhattan, uh, one in Queens, uh, another in the Bronx. Uh, in Albany, where I'm at, um, we serve the food at uh, a place where a lot of people in the community can go. Um, but um, sadly, we can only do it once a week for now. We've been talking about doing it a, a second night and maybe trying to go to places where there could be, uh, there are food deserts. Um, so I'm working right now with uh, understanding where those food deserts might be so that we can do much more of a targeted uh, intervention. Um, I think in rural areas, it's really going to be a problem. Um, I unfortunately don't have any solutions for that either um, because um, it's just the nature also of um, um, how we're trying to tap into resources. Um, and one thing I, I really come to terms with too is that a lot of times the resources are available. Um, there's food, there's more than enough food to feed everyone, but some, somehow there are systemic issues that are making it not possible for the people who really need those resources to get them. And so I guess what I'm saying is that we have a lot more work to do. We have a lot more work to do. All right. Thank you. And unfortunately, we couldn't attend to all of the questions we received today. So um, please feel free to email us at ctech.info at nyu.edu, and we can forward those questions to uh, Keith and Betsy. So just an announcement, um, CTAC is offering a webinar on November 30th, Navigating the Reentry Maze, Holistic Transformative Integrated Case Management. So to register for that webinar, please visit our website, CTAC. NY.org. And then lastly, um, here's our contact information. Uh, as I said, f please feel free to um, send us any questions regarding the webinar, the content. We'll certainly throw that over to our presenters. And um, all of the webinar materials, including the recording and slides, will be made available on our website as well for everybody to access. And I want to thank everybody, especially Elizabeth and Keith, for attending today's webinar. Um, once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation, and we would really appreciate it if you could take a moment to provide your feedback. So on behalf of McSilver, SeaTac, and MCTAC, and our presenters, thank you for joining us today, and have a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.